Welcome to the Agile Book Club. Here are your hosts, Justina and Paul. You never know. You never, never know with us. <laughs> you, you look like... You're like you're building a, a fort or <laughs> yes, something. Separate me like, from my little presentation. <laughs> <laughs> you Stina retreating into fort feminism. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Wait, God. <laughs> I'm engineer now. I don't need my help to do that. <laughs> Was not offering. Like, yes, we are super girls. So yeah. Wow, <laughs> such a folding. <laughs> okay. Beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> oh, I do feel like a man now. <laughs> Need any steel bar spent or anything? <laughs> Are we recording already? Okay. <laughs> if I have to, if I will blow my nose, would that kill your ears, Paul? Let's check. That's totally going in the podcast. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that was an experiment for your own safety. No, no, no. You know what that is. <laughs> that's that's going to be my new dedicated ringtone for, for <laughs> when you call me. <laughs> Alarm clock, no. <laughs> Alarm clock. When you hear that, you want to wake up. When I, when I hear that, I definitely want to get out of wherever <laughs> I happen to be. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then. So, so, um, <clears throat> if you need to make any bodily noises, <laughs> it's fine to edit it out. Just try not to do it and talk at the same time. Oh. Okay, that's that's a good. No sneezing, advice. coughing, blowing your nose, and while yeah. someone's talking. You want me just to die here today? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You've been trying to die all week. Oh yes, but actually, yesterday I just came up with idea during our training that maybe instead of blowing my nose in the training room, I would just get out of the training room and blow my nose outside. That was what I was doing after the first hour. I don't know if you noticed. I was proud of my empathy towards people. You you think I didn't notice? You walk out of the room, and suddenly a panda leaves the room, but I hear an elephant in the hallway. <laughs> you heard that? I thought that they were like, <laughs> really? <laughs> oh my god, you see? Yeah, sometimes we feel like we are superstars, but we are not. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so here we are in the studio again. My goodness gracious. This is going to be an interesting one for, for me, because... I've I spent what three days of the last four days were spent doing full day trainings, so my voice is just about shot, just about shot. I, th I think this this recording might be what puts me over the edge and just leaves me silent for the rest of the holidays, which I don't think anyone in my family would mind too terribly. <laughs> but it is the end of an exciting oh, really? week. Really? <laughs> yeah, and my voice might shut down. Too, but I'm kind of happy with how I sound right now. I sound like a rock star. A few people told me that this flu or whatever I have right now that I brought from France actually serves my voice very good. That it's like deep. Well, yeah, indeed. You you sound like you sound like an old rock star. You sound like Keith Richards. <laughs> okay. So should we get into this? So hello, hello, hello. Good morning, Paul. It's a pleasure to see you. Not in the training room, in the safe space. You think you feel safe? No! <laughs> so, this is going to be the last podcast of 2019. How do you feel about that? Oh, that's so crazy. I still remember when you suggested the podcast. And the first idea was the title, Bad People. <laughs> do you remember? That? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, that would be fun. But I didn't feel like I'm capable of podcasting at all. And then you brought the second idea, which was about books. And I felt like, wow, that goes along with my 
goal for this year to read more and obviously it was June and I didn't read as much as I wanted so I said yes and now here we are. Mm -hmm. I, I still think bad people is a good idea for a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I think we could do it. I think we could pull it off. I think we've got the personalities to pull it off. But indeed, the, the, the book club gives us, the Agile book club gives us a structure, which, which I very much enjoy, and it makes us read, which I also very much enjoy. Yes. And, and you suggest some fabulous titles, um, things I, I'd never thought to read before. So that's, it's really helpful to have somebody else suggesting my books for me. Mm -hmm. And especially this one, the, the one we're reading today is, I wasn't even aware it existed. I didn't know these people. I didn't know the authors. I didn't know this book. It's, it had never cross my radar but i found it absolutely delightful i loved reading it yes so how would you pitch that book well, we, have, we haven't like we haven't even told anybody what it is yet ah yes okay do you want to do it together no because ah. i can't pronounce the author's names uh, just title ah i'll do the title you do the author's names oh, okay. so so what we were reading uh, for this podcast is this is lean resolving the efficiency paradox by Niklas Motich and Per Olström. And it was great. So yeah. elevator pitch. How would I pitch this book? I think this is the best and most readable explanation of the concept of lean that I have ever read. And, you know, since we sell Kanban training and consulting, I'm often faced with people who want to learn Kanban so that they can be lean. And as I explained in my classes, you know, the last two classes we've done this week, one of the things that, that came up that people wanted to learn is how do you do Kanban wrong? What should we look out for? What should we avoid? And I make sure that I include a lot of examples of failed Kanban implementations that I've seen. And, and certainly the biggest one, I think, the biggest, 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 most common failure of any organization to implement Kanban is they implement it at the team level without agreement to pursue evolutionary change. And the second biggest one is without um, encouraging acts of leadership at all levels. So they're really just implementing the tool. And for that reason, because of how common it is in our industry to see this cargo cult like adoption of tools, I would recommend this book to my clients. That's who I'd pitch it to. I'd pitch it to everyone that I did training, consulting, or coaching for before, if I could, before I taught them anything about Kanban. Because this is my pitch. If you're thinking of trying out a lean tool like Kanban practices, read this book first to make sure that that's really what you want. Because all by itself, just making your teams faster is not a business strategy. That's my pitch. How about yours? Impressive, Paul. Impressive. I thought that you will say something else by the beginning of your elevator pitch when you said about the misconception. I thought that you will refer to the state when we are Kanban. We reach the goal. We have boards. We have, you know, continuous replenishment. We have we have limits. We have everything. We are Kanban. We are not doing anything more. I thought that you will say about that. Uh, as a misconception. But okay. Actually, I changed my elevator pitch this morning when I looked at, at the last chapter of the book, which was about designing your lean outfit. And authors put there a beautiful metaphor when it comes for your wardrobe and your clothes system. And for me, there are so many definitions and methodologies and so many... And, different understanding of lean. So if you feel that you are kind of lost with those definitions and people that are saying that their organization is lean or different sorts of understanding, and you feel like you open your wardrobe and there's so many tools, so many ideas, so many definitions, and you have no idea which is true, which is not, you can read this book to sort it out. So whenever you will look for the particular, let's say, casual dress, you can just look into the book and read about the flow efficiency, if it's something that you need right now. If you feel like you are overwhelmed, if you're already a practitioner that is overwhelmed with everything that is happening all around you, and you would like to just clarify of what you know, where to look for more, please read this book. 
Or if you are a new person and you're already over overwhelmed with all of those people who say, you are wrong, this is not lean, or this is lean. Again, do yourself a favor, sort out your garderobe with your knowledge by reading this book as well. Indeed. If you, if, if you don't know what is lean, you can't do much better than a book entitled This is this lean. Is lean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a rocket science. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had a student just like that in my class on Monday when we were gathering all of the expectations, mm -hmm. which is, is the way we start. I like to start my classes is to have people think about and write down what they hope to get out of the class or to, what they hope to get out of the workshop. And then we talk about it. We put them in the wall. And that way I can I can try to adapt my plans in order to better suit their needs and expectations. There was one person in the workshop who just said, I've heard all of these buzzwords, all of these various lean buzzwords, and I, I'm really hoping that at the end of this workshop, I have some kind of a context for understanding what they are and how they all relate mm -hmm. to each other. And um, I recommended him this book. Yeah, because there is so much discussion about definitions, as many authors, as many definitions, as many understanding. And I'm always kind of annoyed when people are saying, but this is not what it stands for. Like, you know, they look at the definition without understanding of it. And then they sometimes try to make you feel like you don't understand it because you don't know the definition. I'm not a huge fan of this approach for learning. Yes, I can imagine. Yeah. So, Paul, what was your first takeaway? What did you learn? Well, I, you know, I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to skip ahead a little bit just because okay. of, of, of what you had to say. Not my first takeaway, but my second or third takeaway was... I really like this idea that one of the main reasons that people have these misunderstandings about lean is that lean can be described from different levels of abstraction. So at, at its highest level of abstraction, lean is, is a set of principles, but it's not a set of principles that it's, it's not even a set of principles that is specific to lean. There, there, are, there are, are lean principles that apply in some contexts and other lean principles that apply in other contexts. So you can try to describe lean from the level of principles, but that doesn't really tell anybody what to do. Or you can describe lean from the level of methods and you can say, well, these are the kind of methodologies that lean organizations use. But somebody who's trying to apply those methodologies without the principles would end up in the same kind of trap as so many of the Kanban uh, organizations that I've seen in which they're they, they have all of the pieces in place, but they're not pursuing continuous improvement. Or you can describe it from the lowest level of abstraction, which they refer to as like individual pieces of fruit. The, the metaphor that they use is at the highest level of abstraction, you have fruit. At the next level of abstraction, you have apples and pears. At the next level of abstraction, you have green apples. And so mm -hmm. if... It gets so confusing because some people say lean is respect for people and others say lean is flow efficiency and others say lean is visual boards and cues and others say that lean is, is Kanban and lean is a Toyota production system. And the truth of the matter is lean isn't any of those, but all of those things can be lean, can be yeah. part of lean. Yes. And when, when you're discussing lean with somebody who's talking about it from a different level of abstraction, it sounds like two people speaking two completely different mm -hmm. languages. So I thought that was a very useful explanation for why it's perfectly normal to be confused about this thing called lean. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the, the first takeaway that I'd like to share. How about yours? Oh, I have so many, but I will start with the efficiency paradox. The efficiency paradox that means that we are wasting resources at all levels, starting from the individual, going through the organizational and perhaps even the social levels. And the core to solve this paradox is actually flow efficiency. That so often we are focused on resource efficiency, that we try to push people to work harder and more, and we don't see the whole system. And I had a horrible ping pong email chain conversation with the tech support recently for our um, accounting software. 
So for the three weeks, I'm, I was having the problem with generating one of the report. And I was sending emails and I was describing the problem and then I was getting email back and then I asked, could you please call me? And this person was like disregarding the message, which was please call me. He was just replying within two or three days. So then I called the customer service and the customer service told me like, we are not solving tech problems. For the tech problems, you have to send the email to the tech. So then I said again, like, could you please call me? Because... I want to like get to the process to make sure that I'm doing everything okay because it's still not generating as it's supposed to do. And yesterday I got the email from this person who told me that they are not allowed to make a phone calls. And at the end there was like, you know, would you like to rate the service? Like, you know, with the <laughs> and I thought to myself that the system that this person is in the flow efficiency is a disaster because it creates so many secondary needs. This problem could be solved by just a phone call that would take five minutes, not three weeks conversation, which led me to like the frustration and, and you know, all sorts of problems. And I engaged this tech person, I can customer service. And also our accountant were like involved because it was something that was unexpected from the software to happen. And I didn't want to write the service because I thought to myself, if I put negative, you know, negative response, this person who was helping me will be judged for the system that it's put, that he or I think it was he, he was put into. So I had like a whole reflection yesterday about how the low flow efficiency creates those secondary needs. And it got me into the first chapter of the book, when the authors describe Alison and Sarah case, when both of them have the same needs, they want to get diagnosed on the breast cancer. And in Alison case, it took art actually 42 days. And in Sarah case, it took actually two hours. So by comparing those two health systems, uh, healthcare system and comparing what, what were they focused on, we can see how focusing on flow efficiency works and how focusing or the resource efficiency works as well. So the story of, of, of these two women is it was a story of two different women, both of whom found a lump in their breasts. In one case, I think it was Allison. So Allison went to her doctor and she needed to get a referral to a specialist. She got the referral to the specialist and made an appointment and the appointment was for two weeks away. She went to the specialist. She waited for the specialist. She had the appointment with the specialist. The specialist agreed that she needed to see a radiologist. And so she had to make a radi appointment with the radiologist and that happened in a few weeks later. And, and she had to go to the hospital and wait for the radiologist. And the radiologist confirmed that there was some, something that they needed to do a biopsy on. So she had to make an appointment with the specialist who performs biopsies. And then she had to wait for that to happen. And then after getting the biopsy, she had to wait for the lab results. And then she had to go in to collect the lab results. And all this time, she had no idea what the outcome was. It took 42 days to get a diagnosis from the moment at which she discovered a lump in her breast. And in the other case, um, and that was Sarah, Sarah went to a specialized clinic that was set up specifically for diagnosing breast cancer. They had all of the specialists in the clinic. She had to wait a few days for an appointment, but when she went in for her appointment, three days after discovering a lump in her breast, she went in. She was on time. She saw the first specialist. The first specialist called the second specialist to look for her. The next specialist called, did, called the next specialist. And so she went in. She saw one doctor. Then she saw a, a radiologist. She got the reports back from the radiologist. So, so they did a biopsy. She had to wait in the waiting room for over half an hour to get the results of the biopsy. But she had her diagnosis two hours after she walked mm -hmm. into the clinic. And what I really liked about this explanation of flow efficiency is flow efficiency is looking at flow from the, from the point of view of the flow unit. In this case, Allison and Sarah were the flow, flow units. How does this process look like from their point of view? And if you're trying to, to optimize for flow, looking from the point of view of the flow unit, the first woman spent a lot of time not getting any value. She would get bursts of value when she was visiting the radiologist, when she was, when she was visiting the specialists, when she was going to collect her results. But in between, she'd have weeks during which she was experiencing no value at all. The opposite type of 
efficiency, resource efficiency, is when you look from the point of view of the resources. And in the case of the doctors, in the first woman's case, if you looked at their life, if you looked at their day from their point of view, they're very busy. Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the metaphors that the authors use that I liked a lot is flow efficiency is like putting a camera uh, yes. on the shoulder of, in this case, the woman who is the flow unit and creating a film of the entire experience mm -hmm. end to end. And in one case, it would be a two hour long film. In another case, it would be a 42 day long film. Flow efficiency is editing that film down just for all of the action moments. Mm hmm. Yep. creating a 20-minute action film out of that 42 days worth of, of video sequence. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've seen, but actually Niklas, he gave a fabulous TEDx talk uh, about improving the process for children to get diagnosed with being autistic and how they actually improve the whole process by just reducing all the waiting stages and being focused on the flow efficiency. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned something else that, that we haven't defined yet, and that yes. is these secondary needs. So I think we should define that. So in the second woman's case, in Sarah's case, she went in, she sat down, and, and she has had some short waiting times in the clinic, but she was always told, have a seat, get yourself a glass of water. This will be about half an hour. And then half an hour later, mm -hmm. the next specialist would come and say, I can see you now. And she was just moved through the process. The first woman who had to make appointments. Now, a patient doesn't make a, an appointment by themselves. They make an appointment by making a phone call and some human being has to have the job mm -hmm. of answering the phone and booking the appointment. Some human being has to have the job of calling to confirm the appointment. If there's any change of plans, some human being has the job of calling to say that we have to re rebook your, your appointment because there's been a change in the schedule. The way I described it in the workshop is if I say, oh, I need a pen and somebody sticks one in my hand, I have a need for a pen and it's instantly satisfied. Mm -hmm. But if I need a pen and I have to order one on the internet, then all of a sudden, I need a pen right now, and so I want to know when this pen is going to arrive. I ordered it to be shipped by an express service because I need a pen quickly, and so I need an estimate. In the first case, I never needed an estimate. In the second case, I need an estimate. And then the next day, I'm starting to worry because I haven't gotten a confirmation, so now I have to contact somebody and ask for a tracking number, another mm -hmm. need. When you don't get immediate satisfaction of your primary needs, it creates secondary needs, and secondary needs creates demands on resources. And so often people think that because these, these resources, often they're people, they can also be machines or software, but because these resources are busy satisfying secondary needs, that they're somehow important and effective. You know, we've got these people who need to make appointments, mm -hmm. and, and this woman is very busy making appointments, and so obviously she's, she's satisfying a need. But if somehow that need could simply be eliminated by offering faster, more efficient service, this is the paradox, which is that if you focus enough on flow efficiency, you get better resource efficiency. Yeah, Or just at least make your tech support capable of doing the phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. But speaking about needs, there was a one part of the book that I really loved and that put smile on my face. And for the record, I love the whole book, but one of them was like a special for me, and it was about indirect needs. And as you all know, I hate cues, as probably most of the people. You gave me some tips on how to handle that. But when I heard and when I read the part about how Walt Disney is handling cues, when you are inside the park and you are queuing to get to the roller coaster, you might be A, annoyed that it takes so long, or B, you might just enjoy other things that are just happening all around you. Like, for example, all of those uh, colorful people, characters from the cartoons that are coming around, that are taking pictures with you. All of these things that are actually happening make you to not be annoyed by the fact that you are still waiting. This makes us feel that we are already benefiting out of the service that we are going to have. So the way how we perceive what is happening is often more important than what is actually happening. So when I think about our conference in May and about this, that we are always trying to reduce queues for uh, cloakroom, for food, maybe when it's so hard to do it because of the number of the people, let's say 500 people, 
we can try to make queues more fun, in, you know, just to deliver people some kind of a different value. So they won't put their attention on the time that they are actually waiting. They will feel that they are benefiting out of it, like just like Walt Disney. And well, isn't that what you did when you invited a cellist to play while people were queuing for registration? Yes, I, I've done it without even like thinking about it. I've done it because that was like opportunity you told me that it would be nice to have some music and of course i had a friend i have a lot of friends for a lot of sorts of things so i just invite her but now i just think that this is really something that can help us to improve the service that we are delivering and this is something that can help our attendees and customers to have a better experience so thank you niklas <laughs> so let's see i i have several more takeaways that's good choose the best one so for my next takeaway, I'm going to skip towards the end of the book. I don't want to give away everything in the book, but there's, there's, there's a few great things in here. And that is this, this idea of the efficiency matrix. So later in the book, after Lean is fully explained, the authors present what they call an efficiency matrix. And it is a four by four matrix in which flow efficiency is on one axis and resources efficiency is on the other axis. And they define these four quadrants. So you get four quadrants. And the quadrant at which both resource efficiency is low and flow efficiency is low, which means that people aren't working very much and stuff isn't getting done, they, they call wasteland. And of course, nobody wants to be there because there's every kind of waste. But I like the others. These are interesting. So when you have very high resource efficiency, but low flow efficiency, so everyone's busy. For example, all of the doctors are busy all day, but the patients are spending a lot of time waiting in between visits. They call this efficient islands. And I think we see that so much. Mm -hmm. Just talking again as, as a Kanban trainer, I am so sick of Team Kanban. The idea that I think it's one of the most common mistakes that companies make is that they want to be lean. And so they teach their teams a lean practice. And they end up with these teams that are individually extremely efficient. But because they depend on other teams to get things done, the actual projects take forever. Because each making each team efficient does not make the organization efficient. You can you can have great um, flow optimization inside of a team. But if you don't have it end to end in your process, then you've got efficient islands. I thought that was a great metaphor. The other situation when you've got really high high flow efficiency, but really low resource efficiency. And this might be, for example, at the clinic, where they have all of these specialists that are all queued up and waiting, mm -hmm. so that when, when a woman needs to see a specialist, the specialist is there waiting. But as long as we have plenty, of, actually, they've got a really good example of it, which is the luxury hotel. Oh, yes. In a luxury hotel, like a really high end hotel, a guest expects any need they have to be satisfied quickly. And the only way you can do that is to have lots of extra staff on hand. You can never have everyone delivering food at the same time. You've, just in case you get a call from, from you know, the, the penthouse suite asking for food, there must be somebody ready to run it straight up. Whatever the need is, there has to be somebody ready to do it. So you've got just this, this army of people who are mostly not busy. Because mm -hmm. if people are busy then you can't satisfy these high-end expensive guests' needs at an instant's notice. So that's a really good example of having just this whole ocean of people in order to make sure that everything flows very, very, very smoothly. And so they call that an efficient ocean. But this perfect state, what they call the perfect state, is where you've got really high flow efficiency without paying for a lot of resources or people who are not actively engaged in adding value. And so that's, that's the kind of ideal state. And there's, there's some conflict. The, the, the main conflict that keeps you from, from achieving this, this perfect state of high flow efficiency and high resource efficiency is variation. Mm -hmm. And so on this matrix, variation kind of presses in, presses down towards the wasteland. And one way of thinking about business strategy is deciding a what you're going to do about that variation and b with that variation pressing down keeping you from achieving the perfect state where on that line between 
resource efficiency and flow efficiency do you want to be? Mm -hmm. If you're focusing more on a high-end product with high margins, you might want to focus more on flow efficiency. So you might be at the flow efficiency end of that, that horizon, that efficiency horizon that's pressing back because of the, the variation in your system. And if you're offering, for example, a, a low cost service and in order to provide low costs, you need to have high resource efficiency, you might actually focus on being at the other end of that limiting horizon. And that is business strategy. And lean is a strategy for moving to, to that horizon, getting as efficient as you can be, and moving along the horizon to get as efficient as you can be in the way that you want to be efficient. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a fabulous definition of lean. Lean is the process of moving closer and closer to your ideal strategic goal. Yes, indeed. That was that was really great chapter and the name Wasteland. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I already started using that in a few situations. Mm -hmm. But if you jump to the end of the book, I will also jump to the end of the book. And actually, I love the question with, are you lean? How lean are you? And the story about European engineering company that invited Oaba-san. Do I pronounce it correctly? Do you know how to pronounce? I do not. Okay. That was one of my takeaways. And the way I was planning on saying it was not using the name at all, because I don't trust myself <laughs> with the name. They, they, they invited one of the world's greatest uh, um, specialists in the Toyota production system to yeah. come and evaluate how lean they were as an organization. Yes. And they decided to show him the whole company. During the whole tour, they were asking him, are we lean? And each time they asked him the question, he just said, hmm, interesting. Yeah. And they were like getting a little bit more anxious and anxious because they were proud of what they achieved. And I felt during this story that they, they needed a prize, that they wanted to see like, yes, we've done everything that we could. We achieved this desired state. We are lean. And then at, at the end, when they had a meeting and then they were kind of already like anxious and maybe I would say maybe a little, little bit frustrated because they needed the answer. That was the reason why they brought him into the company. He Which said, couldn't have been cheap. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> he actually said something that I think was stuck in my head for the rest of my life, which was, it is impossible for me to say I was not here yesterday, which I think is essence of lean. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it illustrates in a very, very clear way that for very that for many companies, lean is like a desired state and is like misunderstanding. They think like, okay, if we are already lean, there's nothing else that we are going to do. We are already a Kanban organization. There is nothing else that we are going to do. So they just put to the trash can the whole idea of change, small improvements and experiments because we are Kanban. There's nothing more that we can do. This kind of the misconception, actually, it's contradiction of what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know the way I, I explained it to myself? Oh, tell me. If you're on a lean journey, the moment at which you believe that you're lean is the moment at which you cease to be lean. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. Yeah. Once you think you've done it, you've stopped trying. And so you are no longer lean. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good one, good one, good one. But there was something I wanted to share about that too, because I... We think about lean as as a process of continuous improvement. And I think a lot of people misunderstand continuous improvement because we teach people in, in our teaching the Kanban method, we teach people to be committed to evolutionary change and to change using experiments and using the scientific method and using models and such. And so it gives the impression that being lean means constantly experimenting mm -hmm. with better ways to do things. And there was something that, that I took away from this that I thought was, was a really very different way of thinking about that. And that's that uh, during the, the story, there's a lot of stories about Toyota. I'm not going to tell all the Toyota stories. Many people have told the Toyota story, and I think they do a good job of telling the Toyota mm -hmm. story in this book, but I'm not going to re rehash the whole thing. But one part of it that stood out in this particular book was the way that Toyota uses visualization to see when anything begins to deviate from the norm. So they know they have a good, stable process that's delighting customers. 
And so, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll actually quote exactly how it was written in the book. Through visualization, we can control the whole organization just by controlling the deviations from the standards. It's the deviations that trigger improvement of the normal state. And that I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that we've got a perfect system and we want to keep it that way. But anytime there's an introduction of some unexpected, some new variation for the, that, that shows up for the first time, because there's always new sources of variation, there are all, always unknowns, and it's where that variation pops up that becomes the opportunity for improvement. Mm -hmm. Not a constant quest to treat, tweak everything yeah. just for the sake of tweaking mm -hmm. it, so that stood out for me. I, I, I thought that was, that was very enlightening. Agreed. <laughs> Should we jump into quotations or is there anything more from the takeaways that you would like to share without spoiling too much book? Can I just share one? Uh, okay. Because <laughs> without, I don't, I don't want to spoil the book by, by calling out all of the fabulous metaphors yes. that exist in this book, because this mm -hmm. book is full of metaphors and stories that, you know, I, I recommended this book for all of my, my clients, but also if you, if you're a, a coach or a consultant or a trainer looking for new metaphors and stories for talking about, about lean, then this book is full of them. And one of the ones that I really liked was the football story. Mm -hmm. So, without giving all of the context, the story is this. What does a football team need to do in order to achieve its goal? What does it need to have in order to achieve its goal? This was the introduction of the idea of Jakoda. Jakoda meaning um, clear visualization of what's happening. In order to achieve their goal, people might say, well, they need to have, have great footwork, they need to have great teamwork, they need to have a good coach, they need to have a good plan. But the answer that the speaker was looking for was they need to be able to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. If they can't see the ball, if they can't see the goal, if they can't see the other team, if they can't see the field, then they cannot achieve their goal. And so he goes on to describe most organizations in which they have this local optimization, they have these highly efficient islands, they have these, these teams that are focused on their individual goals, departments focused on their individual goals. As Imagine as though it were a, a football pitch covered with tents. The opposing team has, has all of their tents. Our team has all of our tents. There are lots of balls on the field and the tents are full of players. There's players running around outside the tents. There's players inside the tents who can't see what's happening outside. And the players inside the tent feel a great satisfaction every time they manage to kick a ball out of the tent. But the goal is still the same. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that metaphor of a bunch of people in tents mm -hmm. playing soccer yeah. or playing football was a perfect analogy for the way that we achieve local optimization inside of modern corporations. Yes, you are right. The book is so full of great metaphors that are bright and just get to the point for people to understand yeah the essence of many many aspects yeah i love that one too so let's jump to favorite quotations what were some of your favorite quotations of course a lot but i will keep it simple so values define how an organization should behave principles define how organizations should think methods define what an organization should do tools define what organization should have and I love that for the various reasons that it shows that it's not only about values, it's not only about finding people who think the same and who cherish the same values and want to achieve similar dreams and goals. It's not only about the principles, it's not only about the method, it's about all of those components serves different needs, different reasons, and we should keep them all in our mind. Indeed, and they should all be in alignment. Exactly. So one of my favorite quotations follows very naturally off of yours. And that is that so often, because I see so often companies trying to pursue their goal by focusing specifically on how they're going to do it, not on the goal itself, 
So they're not looking at the higher abstraction levels. They're not starting with values and principles. They're starting with tools. Let's do lean, or mm -hmm. let's do less. Let's let's do safe. Let's do Scrum. Let's do Kanban, and that will make us better somehow. Where better typically just means faster, maybe cheaper, without actually making sure that that's aligned with the whole organization's principles and values. And the the, the quotation is this: the focus on the goal creates flexibility. Whereas a focus on the means may create limitations. So if you have a goal and you think about the principles and values that are going to help you to achieve that goal, you can extrapolate and discover from that any of a wide variety of tools that might help you to get there. But if you start with a tool and the tool isn't properly aligned with your goals, you may find that you can't achieve your goals because of the tool that you chose. Mm -hmm. You're limiting yourself unnecessarily. Yeah, yeah. I have one more. Mm -hmm. Flow efficiency focuses on the amount of time it takes from identifying a need to satisfying that need. I think that that was really great and simple definition of flow efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. That's a nice, clear, and, and, and concise definition of flow flow efficiency. So just for the balance, I can tell you, I, I can allow you to have one more. Well, I've got another about flow efficiency as well. Okay. Because there's, the flow efficiency obviously is a, a, an important concept in this book. It comes up quite a lot. So mine is flow efficiency is not about increasing the speed of value adding activities. It is about maximizing the density of the value transfer and eliminating non-value adding activities. It's not about speeding up what you're doing right. Mm -hmm. It's about eliminating all of the stuff you're doing wrong. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. 2020 is coming. <laughs> Changes <laughs> will be everywhere. Okay. Do you have another one you want to share? Because I do. No, I, I have like a list of them, but I'm going to publish them on our social media. So I don't want to give away all of them. Okay. I've got one more that I want to share. Just because I think it's it's worth thinking about, and I like the way it's worded. Toyota's strategy involves having free capacity on hand in order to deal with unexpected events. And what I like about that is it defines having this capacity as a key component of its strategy. So idle workers by strategic design, mm -hmm. we are designing idleness designing idle workers into the system deliberately. And I like to call attention to that because it's one of the, it's one of the other things that, that is very common. If I had to list like the most common reasons for failure of a Kanban system to achieve the goals for which it was put into place, at the top would be a lack of commitment to improvement. But the next would be a lack of commitment to, to understanding and optimizing for flow efficiency. Mm -hmm. okay. Because people, especially people at the team level, are so focused on resource efficiency. Employees and companies are so terrified of being seen to be idle. And so many managers are uncomfortable seeing workers being idle that it's incredibly difficult to do. And I always, I try to draw attention to this by explaining it this way, which is that anytime I'm in a daily standup with a team and every single team member in the standup is busy doing something, that is a guarantee, no question, this team is not efficient. If anything comes up, if anyone needs help, there's no one to help them. If anything turns out to be harder than they thought it would be, there's no one to help. If there's anything that's discovered, there's there's no way to incorporate it into the process. It's just going to have to queue up in front. If, if somebody just needs to bounce ideas off of somebody, everyone's too busy to bounce ideas and help them get them get past their block. So you might you end up with with developers who just get stuck and they end up spending an entire afternoon on Stack Overflow when being able to turn to their neighbor and pair for half an hour would have solved the problem. But of course, they can't turn to their neighbor and pair for half an hour because their neighbor is busy. Everybody's busy. So when people ask me how long it takes to implement Kanban at the team level, 
I usually tell them it takes about two years because you can put all the all the me- mechanics in place very quickly. You can come in, you can plan out the si- plot out the system. You can go through a day long static exercise, and at the end, they've got a Kanban system design. But if you come back in six months, I bet you anything, you're going to find people using the exact same system design that they designed six months ago, and they're still going to be optimizing for resource efficiency because people are terrified to be idle. It takes months and months and months of coaching before before a coach starts hearing those magic words. So what are you working on today? I'm not. I'm not working on anything right now because I can see that Anna has put a great deal of effort into this key component, and she's going to be finishing any time in the next hour or two, and it's going to need me to work on it next, and I don't want it sitting in a queue. So I'm just going to be over here reading blog posts and and, and trying to, to work on upping my skills, and most importantly, most importantly, the best thing I could possibly do for this team and for this company is to be ready when Anna finishes that piece of work so that work keeps flowing smoothly. And I've never worked with a team in which that started happening consistently and comfortably in less than six months. And people don't get really good at it until they've been doing it for a year or more. So long exposition, but but this is something I feel really strongly about. You've got to build a certain amount of slack into the system before you can focus on flow efficiency. And I think that actually this book gives a lot of good examples on how to explain the flow efficiency in order to even make your point stronger. But, you know, David Anderson has a really good point that you cannot use logic to argue against an emotional argument. If a person's coming from a, from a place of fear, no amount of logic will help. That's why you need... That's why I, I say it takes a really, mm-hmm. really long period of gentle coaching to get people to this place because you have to address the fear before you can even start talking to their their yeah. their human brain. Yeah. You got to get past the lizard brain first. Yes, definitely. So, <laughs> Paul, that was the book that I suggested for this month. Do you have anything that you would like to read in the next month? Yes. Um, you know, one of the things I like about this podcast is, is um, I like the opportunity to introduce people to brand new books as they come out and, and to, to new authors. And we've done a mix of these. We've we've reviewed some books that have just come out, and we've reviewed other books that are that are old classics that people should probably revisit. And I noticed that Ryan Ripley, I wouldn't even say has just published a book, is just publishing a book. It's coming out very soon. It's being published by Pragmatic Programmers, which is a fabulous publishing house. And the title is very intriguing. So I trust the publishers. I trust the author, and the title intrigues me, and it is Fixing Your Scrum, Practical Solutions to Common Scrum Problems, and it's by Ryan Ripley and Todd Miller. And so I think it would be a lot of fun to read something something fresh and new. Mm -hmm. And it will be published in January 2020. I think so. Okay. In case, if it will be in February and we might still need a book for, for the next month. I was going to suggest actually thinking in bets. Have you read that? No. Thinking in bets, making smarter decision when you don't have all the facts. It is actually a book uh, by the ex-poker player. And this book keeps coming back to me on some agile conferences. It's already the third time that I took a picture after someone's presentation when they were referring to that book. And also... uh, Cliff Hazel, he recommended that book too, that it's a great book to read and that we should review it in the future. So maybe if it's coming to us and your book mm-hmm. won't be published by the time that we need it, we can just change. Okay, I love your suggestion as well. So so we'll read Ryan Ripley's book if we can get our hands on it in the next yes. few weeks. And if not, your suggestion sounds fabulous. Otherwise, it can be our March read. Yes. Okay, Perfect. sounds terrific. So, this is the last Agile Book Club of 2019. And our listeners, they will hear that on the 1st January 2020. I doubt it. (laughs) (laughs) It'll be out there. 
But I suspect they'll have other things on their mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> those, those of you who are listening to this on the day that it comes out, I hope you're feeling well. Welcome to 2020. Yes. I hope you had a great night last night. And stay tuned for many, many more fabulous Agile Book Club episodes to come. Yes. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your support. We love our listeners. And again, if there's any books that you want us to review, let us know. We'll certainly consider them. If you've got any... Oh, here's the thing. This podcast, because we're both going to be on holiday until into January, this podcast will come out before we have a chance to interview the author of the book. So here's your opportunity to get your own questions asked. So if you're listening to this podcast during the first week of January... Send an email to us. It'll, our email addresses will be in the show notes if you have any questions that you'd like us to include in our interview with the authors. And if we use them, we'll mention your name and thank you for the contribution, and we'll ask your questions to the authors of This Is Lean in the next podcast. So thank you very much and Happy New Year. Happy New Year.